Hello, everyone. This is Dark Journalist. Tonight, I have a special interview for you as Oxford Scholar and Giza Death Star book series author Dr. Joseph Farrell returns to the show to reveal his new book, The Demon in the Acre, dealing with plasma life, Nikola Tesla, and the Great Pyramid. Dr. Farrell goes deep to reveal an ancient knowledge of physics and sacred monuments with a worldwide network of communications via magnetic lines by a forgotten civilization. Please join us now. Joseph, it's great to have you back. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Daniel. <laughs> You've been very busy lately, but tonight yeah. we're going to take you back to future past, and we're going to really get deep into your book, The Demon in the Acre, uh, which is basically the tremendous kind of touch on all of the Giza Death Star book series, mm-hmm. which you've been writing over the past two decades. Yeah, um, the book... Uh, it's the book I really wanted to write years and years ago. In fact, the the idea of the plasma life hypothesis has been around a long time. My listeners that have been with me ever since George Ann Hughes will recall me talking oh, yeah. about yeah, will recall me talking about the plasma life hypothesis briefly on a couple of her shows, but I've never I've never elaborated it in the um in the original version of the Giza Death Star, which I sent out to a different publisher than originally published the book, I originally sent it to a very different publisher. And in that version of the book, I mentioned the demon in the acre, which is a, a quotation in one of the epigraphs from Zechariah Sitchin that I had originally put in the original version of the book. And When the original publisher I submitted to rejected the book, I had also, in the meantime, kept crunching numbers. And I decided to rewrite the book with the additional information and take that part out because it was just too, uh, it was too off the end of the twig. I mean, you know, if you're talking about pyramids as weapons and now you're adding demons. (laughs) (laughs) yes that 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 dog don't hunt so you know um you're already pretty deep out there yeah i was really already off the end of the twig and people already think i'm you know as it is so um i i took it out and the other problem at that time was other than uh some weird rumors associated with david bohm the the physicist david bohm and every now and then a little a little whisper from the scientific community that they're noticing weird things about plasmas and they might be alive. Mm. Um, there wasn't much out there about it. So, you know, I, I thought, okay, well, th- we'll just table this. Uh, a British um, author that I like very much by the name of Robert Temple wrote a book called A New Science of Heaven. And he lays out in, you know, he just does yeoman's work on on the plasma life hypothesis. He lays it out there rather well. Um, So I was kind of waiting for someone else to take the deep dive, um, which he does. The Demon in the Acre book I decided to do because... Uh, Temple's approach is largely from a Gnostic point of view, and and quite frankly, you can do much better uh, in terms of patristic sources. That you know, I have a lengthy quotation from Saint John of, of Damascus ah. in the Demon in the Acre book, which, if you read it, is really kind of breathtaking, uh, and it, it dovetails very nicely with a plasma life hypothesis. So I decided to write the book um, just to kind of flesh out a different approach to the plasma life hypothesis. And with some specific reference to Sitchin, who is, I think, clearly implying it in his books, um, and also with clear reference to uh, 
not only to the patristic tradition, but also just to kind of flesh out the the hypothesis that I've I've mentioned on many occasions that that nuclear devices, nuclear plasmas, gate energy from the medium. Mm. Well, if you if you start thinking of plasmas as being that medium, then it begins to make sense. Interesting. So anyway. You know what's fascinating when thinking about that is Sitchin. Mm-hmm. Because Sitchin himself, we have to remember, and I think you point this out really well, just how original so much of the work he did was, even though he oh, raised yes. the controversy and he was maybe overused, you know, yeah. in the uh, Nephilim space right. visitors kind of um, thing that was going on in Anunnaki, you know, every, yes. every other word in the alternative media around this for a while was Anunnaki. But what you did is you kind of you t- went back there and dusted off a lot of the controversy and said, well, here's the real hardcore part right. of what he laid out, you know, right. aside from all that. Well, this is this is what you encounter with Sitchin over and over again. Um, I am not a subs- – he has a what I call a macro scenario. And his macro scenario is that every six uh, – pardon me, 3,600 years, the planet Nibiru comes careening into the so- solar system and creates chaos. And in his version, he, he is very clear – that it's coming in almost perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic of the solar system. And, you know, I'm my reaction to that at the time was that's nonsense. <laughs> because if you have a planet that size with a cyclical reappearance coming in perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic, it's going to, you know, it's going to leave this sort of motion on the plane of the ecliptic. And the planets are going to be doing this like fishing bobbers on on a lake surface well they're not doing that so you know this is my this is my problem with the macro scenario that that he he proffers and of course as it's coming through they are sending their rockets and spaceships to earth to get gold and they had to have slaves to mine it so they created us (laughs) right yeah so, and I'm sorry, number one, rockets ain't going to do it any more than they're going to be adequate for mining asteroids. I'm sorry. Um, so there are aspects of his scenario I never, I never subscribe to. However, once you, once you table that, Sitchin is at his best when he is going into little details that are not necessarily any major component of his larger scenario. Uh, for example, and I point this out in The Demon in the Acre, Sitchin spends a lot of time arguing in his book, The Wars of Gods and Men, that the wars that are being fought are being fought over the the Giza compound and by means of it. In other words, he clearly implies that these things, that, and especially the Great Pyramid, is a weapon. It's a weapon system. And then he he points out that there are expressions in Sumerian texts, such as the the land below the beyond the horizon, and so on and so forth. Are if you look at them from a Mesopotamian point of view, they are geographical references to Egypt. They're not metaphor. Uh And then he points out that on Sumerian seals, you actually have smooth-sided pyramids being depicted, not the stepped pyramids that you see in the ziggurats of Mesopotamia, and on and on. So what what Sitchin is arguing there are details. He's comparing a text, and then he's comparing the text to the cylinder seals and, and taking all of that as a body of data and saying, well, this is about Egypt is what this is about. So when, when yeah, when Sitchin is going into details like that, he excels because that's where you're going to find the nuggets in Sitchin. Forget about Nibiru and Baalbek being a spaceport for massive rocket ships and, you know, all the other nonsense. Um, it's it's when he goes into that kind of detail that he excels. Sitchin, by the way, is the one that, again, notices a detail that the uh, 
the so-called vice inscriptions in the relieving chambers above above the king's chamber where Howard Vice allegedly discovered the cartouche of Khufu. Right. Well, Sitchin was the first one to point out that it's not even spelled correctly. Right. And Sitchin raised and opened up that whole can of worms that, you know, this this whole thing attributing the Great Pyramid to Khufu is based on a hoax. Mm-hmm. And it has been a controversy until just very recently. Right. You know, so, and again, once you know what the controversy it was, it's very clear that Sitchin was both right and wrong mm-hmm. uh, in some of his detail. He was right on the basic hypothesis. He got a few details wrong because he didn't have access to the information we have now. So Sitchin, um, again, I think you have to read Sitchin and appreciate the details. That's where he excels. Fascinating. You know, it's interesting, too, because um, that new reporting that came out totally blows away the vice scenario. Oh, totally. About Kufu. Yeah. 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 So that they should just start from scratch on that, really. Well, they're not going to do that because Egyptology has, you know, has has locked itself into the standard academic narrative of human right. history. So in other words, for them to revise it now, you'd, you'd really have to revise what at quackademia, as I like to call it, uh, <laughs> what they have to say about, about the ba- basic outline of human history. And once you've said that, you know, it's, it's open game on everything. And they're not going to do that. Because then they'd have to admit what they cannot afford to admit is that all this chatter that's been going on for a century and a half about Atlantis and giants and you know everything else might have some truth to it. So yes. can't go there. <laughs> right. Right. Well it's interesting to think about Casey and Steiner and others putting on the map the idea that the pyramids are much older. Oh yeah. And uh then you have researchers on the ground doing the same thing like Robert oh, yeah. Schock and, and people like that. Yeah. So the scenario going from 2500 BC to 10,500 BC, <laughs> 8,000 years in between, yeah. what happened? Well, yeah, and in, in we're we're in the standard model, we're being asked that all of a sudden we gave up hunting and gathering and decided to invent mathematics and agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> right. <you're- laughs> Come it, was on. Just, it was just the right thing to do it was just the right thing to do you know the time <laughs> the time was right you know <laughs> um it's, it's wackadoodle <laughs> it really yeah. is when you look at the age of the pyramid and uh you know you've attributed the kind of fortress great pyramid idea to sitchin mm-hmm. Um, and then, but you brought it out. You're the one who brought it all the way down the ball field with these two decades of books. Um, where do you see the age of the great pyramid and the complex at Giza? Where would you have it fall in the timeline? Well, I, I do agree with Alan Alford, uh, the British author, uh, of, of the book called the Phoenix solution, which is his attempt to, flesh out a chronology of of the Giza compound. I do agree with his basic hypothesis that there are three chronological layers of construction there. The oldest layer is represented by the Great Pyramid itself. And the reason why he puts it at the beginning of the process is when you look at the evolution of of architecture in the land of Egypt as a whole, what you see is a very clear decline in the perfection of the structures being built. Mm -hmm. So if you look at if you look at Giza, the Great Pyramid is just way beyond anything else in Egypt, period, in terms of the perfection and close tolerances and everything else you can think of in that structure. It's just, it's really just off the charts. Then there is a second layer, not quite as old in his opinion, that is a little bit declined from that standard of perfection. And that layer 
of chronological construction at Giza is represented by the Pyramid of Sephron, the second big pyramid there, the one that everybody thinks is the Great Pyramid, even <laughs> yeah. though it's not. Uh, and then the, the Valley Temples and the Sphinx. So in other words, those things are, in Alford's opinion, a slightly declined second chronological layer of construction. And then the third and youngest layer of construction at Giza is the properly Egyptian layer, which would be recommend, represented by Menkare and then the um, the very small little pyramids that are around there, the burial temples and so on and so forth. Now, where I depart from Alford is that having said that I think he's correct in that there are three layers there, his dating of the Great Pyramid is about the same as everybody else's, circa 10,500 B.C. And one reason that, that most alternative scholars give that date is because there, and I put this in the Giza Death Star Revisited, there is a Persian and Arabic tradition that when the casing stones were on the pyramid, you could see a water line about halfway up on those casing stones. And that, according to their uh, old traditions, was was the result of the flood. So Mm -hmm. in other words, if you're dating the flood to circa 10,500 A.D., and you are crediting that, that little bit of lore as being a nugget of information coming from that time period, then, yeah, the Great Pyramid has to be older than the flood. Now, one of the interesting things that uh, Ralph Ellis, the the alternative author, told me at a conference years and years ago, we we were both speaking uh, at a conference at Adventures Unlimited, Uh, Ralph pulled me aside after the conference when, you know, we're just sitting around having our Cokes and pretzels. Um, He pulled me aside and he said, did you know that there was a bunch of debris at the base of the Great Pyramid that, you know, had been kind of piled up against it that had fossils and so on from about five million years ago? And I said, no, I didn't know that. And I said, what, what's the significance? He said, well, the debris has apparently been there. It wasn't, it wasn't just left there. In other words, what he, was, what he was trying to suggest was that that debris had been deposited and left by the flood. Well, if that's the case, then the pyramid is an extremely old structure. And that, that is my... Um, That's kind of my opinion. I think it is an extremely old structure. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and in my opinion, and again, this is just me. I, you know, I have no evidence other than that very anecdotal story, which, you know, doesn't qualify as much evidence at all. But I do think that the pyramid, uh, the great pyramid is probably an extremely old, old structure. Um, I really do. Maybe, Hundred thousand years back? Oh, older than that. Older, well, older. older than that. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, I, I think it's the oldest structure on the planet. I fascinating. Do. Yeah, and I think it's probably sitting on the site of structures that were once there, even older than that. Uh, I, mm. I really do. I think it's. I think it's a very, very old structure. But that's just me, you know. Um, who uh, Who made it? Well, in my opinion, I think it is a human structure. But I, and this is the other reason I think it's why it's so old. There is such a multiplicity of, of dimensional analogs present in the structure that cannot be there by accident mm-hmm. and had to have been put, put there by a scientifically sophisticated culture. And I don't see that sophistication in science even in a culture 10,500 years old that may pre-exist the flood. For one thing, we don't know much about that culture. So in other words, the, the dimensional analogs present in the structure indicate to me that they had to have knowledge at least of some of the uh, constants of modern physics, like you know Planck's constant and so on and so forth. 
Well, we didn't find that out until 1905. What's it doing in the pyramid? Right. So, in other words, whoever built it had an extraordinarily sophisticated scientific knowledge. And to find that kind of knowledge, I think you either have to date the pyramid to modern times, which is absurd, of course, or you have, <laughs> you have to go way, way back and posit that there was a uh, a very sophisticated civilization on this planet, and they built it. So that's that, that's my hypothesis. I think humans built it, and that we're we're literally looking at a monument from Atlantis, quite literally. Yes. You know, yes. It, it Interesting. Happened. Um, that's interesting about the whole structure around it being older as well, the whole plateau. Yeah. Uh, when you think about the Sphinx and the stories about the great age of the Sphinx, and some mm -hmm. things have been proven mm -hmm. about the Sphinx that Shock did with weather uh, right. watering thesis. Right. And uh, that, that was pretty solid, and, and the Egyptologists yes. just blocked it. Oh, they, 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 yeah, you know, the scientific quackademics, um, are, are they they can't even they can't even admit it yes it, it's a case of let's bury our head in the sand and pretend it will go away and nobody <laughs> will notice <laughs> yeah right and a really entrenched political process exactly in that. exactly yeah. you get national uh, geographic and hawass and all those yep, people yep. in this marriage to kind of keep this yeah well you know if you if you look at the fundamentalisms of judaism Christianity and Islam, they don't want this to be uh, an old monument because that knocks that knocks their their religious chronologies into a cocked hat. Right. And you know, I, I was I was reading some prayers the other night before I went to bed. And it's an old Orthodox prayer book that that the publishing information was that the book was published in the 7920 something year of, of the creation and i think okay come on <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh yeah so i i think there's that's, a lot of dating problems going there's on a, there well you know and i'm the first to admit it you know this is this is the problem i have is people ask me well you know when does this happen and that happen? And it's like I, I tried to point out in my book, The Cosmic War. If you're looking at the flood, blown up, exploded planets, ancient wars of the gods, and when did this tribe migrate from Asia to South America? You know, when you start asking questions like that and try to put all of these chronologies together, you end up with chaos. Right. Because there is no way to do it and account for all of them from one consistent scholarly scientific paradigm. There is not. Right. right. So we're confronted with a mystery. Why do we have these different why do we have these different chronologies? Now I expect and I do suspect that there can be and will be a resolution eventually. But I don't see it being done by anybody in in um, in current scholarship because it's just too daunting of a task. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to have to familiarize yourself with with the esoteric cosmology of the Vedic literature, mm -hmm. most of which has not been translated from the Sanskrit. Uh -huh. On top of that, you're going to have to familiarize yourself with Confucian chronology and Taoism and ancient Shinto chronology in Japan. And then you're going to have to familiarize yourself with the chronologies and approximate times of Australian Aborigines and South American Amerindians and on and on and on we go. And this right. is, you know, anybody telling you they have the answer for the chronological question, uh-uh. Mm -hmm. All I'm trying to do in my books is say, okay, we have certain dates that we can fix with more or less uh, certainty. Like Van Flandern's exploded planet, you can fix to 65 million or 3.2 million years ago. And that's fairly certain. So I've, you know, I've gone with a 3.2 million year date as one of those dates you can fix. The 10,500 B.C. date for the flood on the Earth, that seems to be fairly secure. Mm -hmm. However, the problem there is 
the flood on the Earth is is not a planetary wide flood as you have depicted in the records. The only evidence in the entire solar system for a planetary wide flood is on Mars. Mm. <laughs> okay, and <laughs> and you know again, depending on who you consult for the date, is it Van Flanders' three point two million years, or is it Doctor Mark Carlotto's six thousand or six hundred and fifty thousand years? based on Sidonia and Celestial alignment, you know, whose who's chronology are you going to go with here? Mm -hmm. This is my problem. Well, you're opening up a lot there, too, because yeah. if you think of the flood as something that took place somewhere else. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, I do. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that, that it wasn't a catastrophic planet, uh, planet-sized event on this planet, but in terms of the geological record, mm. Mars is it. If you want a whole planet that shows evidence of a flood, that's it. Fascinating. So, you know, um, that, that raises another little problem that uh, Robert Temple pointed out in his book, The Serious Mystery, The Dogon Tribe, and, you know, all of their mythologies, oh, we come from that star. And mm -hmm. then you've got the Zulus on top of that in South Africa saying, oh, yeah, we arrived here. We came from Mars and we arrived here on America. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> right. You know, yeah, so the it's, thing, their knowledge of the astronomy is just how are you going to deny that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can't. So there's too many there's too many problems not just with the quackademic standard narrative that, you know, 8,500 years ago, we gave up hunting, hunting and gathering and built the Sphinx, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, you have the hints that the Sphinx is the sentinel of a hall of records from this older culture. Could be. I don't know. I mean, you know, you, you like uh, Edgar Casey, and that seems to be his view. It could be. I don't know. Do you see anything in the Great Pyramid that could be similar to that, what Casey's getting at with the Sphinx and the Hall of Records? Well, I, in, in a certain sense, the Great Pyramid is the Hall of Records because you have all of those dimensional analogs and physics constants embedded redundantly in that mm -hmm. structure. In other words, there's so much of it that whoever built and designed the thing uh, you know, it, it boggles my mind how anybody can do that out of their head. Right. I, you know, I'm thinking whoever did this dang thing, you know, whoever the architect was probably had uh, a pretty hefty computer aided design program to do it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> because I yeah. certainly wouldn't want to sit down and try and cram all of that stuff into one structure and do it in the way that they did where mm -hmm. you, you can see all these little harmonic feedback loops. I mean, they're obvious to me as an organist. I can sit and tell you that whoever's doing this is thinking in terms of harmonic series. I, oh, that's just crystal yeah. clear. Um, so uh, it whoever designed the thing uh, is embedding, for whatever reason, embedding dimensional analogs of so much of the physics of local space time in that structure, that that in a certain sense is your observer. It is your hall of records. Hmm. Now the question is why were they doing this? If, if you want to create a bureau of weights and measures, I can think of several much easier, less cost worthy and less labor intensive ways than to build that. You know, <laughs> to, to do it, I, I think I think the 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 dimensional analogs are there not for an archival purpose, but for a functional purpose. Oh, right. This is this is where I absolutely part company with everybody that says it's just all the records. No, it's not. There's mm. a reason for all that stuff there. It's functional. It's function machine. It's a machine, right? That that brings us to Chris Dunn. If it's a machine, well, then it's a power plant, says Chris mm -hmm. Dunn. Okay, right. what kind of power plant do you design that you have all of those harmonic dimensional analogs in present in the power plant? 
Well, unless you're Nikola Tesla, none. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that is fascinating. And Dunn, you could say, was a kind of breakthrough in that he was seeing this whole, this is how oh, yeah. he set yeah. it up as an energetic, energy-producing structure. Right. But now, it's interesting. He's published a new book. Oh, really? Just recently, where he's arguing that the pyramid is a is a Tesla type power plant, That's and I think he's done that because he did mention in his original book that you know this has got something to do with Tesla, but he never explains why. Oh, I see. So yeah. my suspicion is in his new book. I have not read it yet because it hasn't been you know hasn't been uh, released. But my suspicion is that, yeah, he can't ignore all those dimensional analogs either. He's got to explain functionally, if it's a machine, then they have a function. All those analogs have a function. Mm. So what is it? <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So he's got um, to that's, that's interesting. A, what great timing with him putting this out. And of course, yeah. we're getting into Tesla later in this episode. Right. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying my interview with Dr. Joseph Farrell. A quick reminder here to join us on Friday, November 17th for a very special presentation and documentary. JFK 60, Blue Enigma, The UFO File, Secret Space Program, and The Assassination. We will make public some important new findings in our investigation of the JFK assassination. Please join us next Friday at 8 p.m. When I get to, and we haven't even got to the demon part yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> what I get to with your work around the Giza Death Star is that you you place it in this important position that it is fundamentally the ultimate kind of cosmic weapon, so yes. powerful that it can in fact destroy a planet. Right. right. Um, so that's, you're, you're giving the builders an absolute science astronomy mastery beyond anything yeah. we can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really kind of a, um, it's kind of an argument of, of, piling a lot of little arguments together and saying that if if all of these things are true then we're not dealing with any sort of you know i'm 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 trying to take the the scientific explanation which is radical in and of itself as far as i can take it based on what we know about these types of systems in alternative science already. In other words, Tesla plays a huge role. Yeah. And the reason that Tesla plays a huge role is that Tesla noticed that in his uh, Colorado Springs experiments, that the geometry of the circuit itself depend is absolutely in direct relationship to the amount of power the system will put out. And as part of his geometry, you have to remember that what he's doing is he is creating an electrical acoustic pulse by slamming gobs of voltage up against a momentarily infinite resistance barrier. That's key because it's like it's like a diver off a high dive uh, board in a swimming pool. If he belly flops for that, instant of contact with the surface of the water he is meeting a virtually infinite resistance and the water shoots out in all directions from him that's what tesla's doing with the electricity the electricity is not moving through the wire it's hitting up in a massive pulse of voltage against an infinite resistance barrier, and then that electroacoustic pulse, which is a pressure wave, moves over the surface of the wire rather than through it. Interesting. Yeah. And he goes on to say, and part of the multiply what will multiply that effect is the segmentation of the circuit. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have in the Great Pyramid. You have a massive segmentation of a piezoelectric uh, substance like granite and limestone, which can multiply the effect if you pulse that whole structure. So you're going to create, and the other part of, of my thinking is if you look at the pyramid, what is it? It's a waveguide. Mm. So you're creating a 
massive pulse that moves through and over all of the surfaces of the structure. Mm -hmm. And once you see that, then you start looking at the dimensions of the structure and you discover that there is a harmonic relationship. Even in, um, to the extent, Daniel, if you look at the thickness of the stone courses from the bottom of the pyramid to the top, you know what you find if you graph it? What is that? You find a waveform. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, a waveform, inc incidentally, of decreasing amplitude and therefore increasing frequency as you move from the bottom to the top. What does that tell you about? That tells me it's, it's a hugely harmonic device, and therefore what they're playing around with are the harmonics not only of acoustics but of electricity. So in other words, it's, it, is, it is in this sense a Tesla device. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and again, that was Chris Dunn that made that observation years and years ago. I'm simply trying to explain it. Mm -hmm. The demon in the acre is the problem because Sitchin clearly having, having coupled these Mesopotamian texts and cylinder seals to, to Giza also points out that in some of these Mesopotamian texts, you now have a demon associated with that. Pardon me, with that structure. Why? Interesting. Acre is the Akkadian word for a mountain. As I point out in the Cosmic War, that term can also be used. It's also uh, translated oftentimes as mountain house. So, in other words, it is also a term for a ziggurat or a mountain house of a god huh so in other words it's a it's a a dwelling place a, a temple so in other words acre can mean in the way it's used it can mean a literal mountain it can mean a pyramid or a ziggurat and if you follow what i said in the cosmic war it can also be used as a planet hmm. so it's doing all that duty well i I'm arguing that by putting a demon into the thing, you're effectively, if, if you're putting a plasma inside the thing, you've got your demon. It's a plasma life form. Lo and behold, if you go back to Christopher Dunn, uh, the Giza power plant, he argued in that book that, that the structure was creating hydrogen gas inside the structure that was being made down in the queen's chamber and then filtering up through the structure which ultimately exploded at one point oh wow. yeah, yeah. And, there, and there is evidence in inside the king's chamber if you look at the way the king's chamber is all kind of you know lopsided mm -hmm. and stuff it appears that there was at a certain point an explosion inside it so you know, I factory I, explosion. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm thinking. Okay, if you've got hydrogen gas in there, it could it be in some sort of endothermic plasma state, possibly. And once you've said plasma state, then you've got you've got with the plasma life hypothesis, you've got your your demon in the acre. Mm. Um, and then there's there's on top of this. There are, as I point out in the book, there are the esoteric lore connections of the Great Pyramid. Right. Because, with Hermes? Well, not just with Hermes, but you've got, you've got the positioning of the Great Pyramid on the surface of this planet mm -hmm. at, at the precise point of the fanning out of the Nile Delta. But also, if you look at where it's positioned in terms of the surface area of the landmass of the earth, it's almost smack dab in the center of it. That's interesting. In other words, yeah. it's at the perfect place for a seat of government. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's the old saw that, that the great, the apex of the great pyramid appears to have been the ancient prime meridian of the planet because every other megalithic structure on the planet is located with respect to the apex of the Great Pyramid as the prime meridian. Mm -hmm. So whoever built it, in other words, is thinking the prime meridian of the planet runs through this spot. Mm -hmm. So if you have it as a seat of governments and you have it as a, a weapon that can enforce that government, mm -hmm. not only on this planet, but in 
the neighborhood of local celestial space, then it would make sense to locate your governing principality there, Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Lucifer in esoteric lore is the governing archangelic principality and power, so to speak, of this planet prior to the fall. Interesting. So, you know, all of this seems to kind of come together, and that's that's more or less is the case I was trying to lay out in, in the demon and the acre. Do you get like a there's kind of a almost like a black white aspect to this because you get also the lore around the pyramid that it's this initiation chamber for yes. higher mysteries. And so it seems to be battling, you know, when you have them inserting the demon in the acre, it's almost like it's been hijacked. Well, I don't I don't think of it as hijacked at all. I said in the, you know, and this puts me in a very different camp for most people that look at the Great Pyramid. Right. Um, because I in the very first Giza Death Star book, I, I right in the introduction, I pointed out to people that I've never felt anything good about this structure ever. Interesting. Ever. It has always creeped me out since I was a kid. Uh, For its so sophistication? Everything about it. Mm. And I don't necessarily view it as, uh, you know, demons can initiate you in mystery schools just as well as the good guys can. Right. So, you know, that doesn't provide me any, any big problem. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, especially if you look at, the use of the site and and what has been said about the site in some other e ancient Egyptian texts, like the Edfu Temple texts and so on, which clearly show, associate that site with with very ancient wars. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's nothing about this thing, uh, the hypothesis itself, that um, bothers me too much i know it bothers a lot of people in the alternative community mm -hmm. because just as soon as i published the first uh giza death star book i got an angry letter from a very well-known figure at that time in the alternative research community it was it was it was literally a six-page email Wow. That that was just castigating me and chewing me <laughs> out for daring to, su to suggest that all was not jonquils and daisies in ancient Egypt, <laughs> and that his particular Egyptian wisdom teacher had told him that I'm just wacko because he knew, you know, and on and on it went. Wow. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I can, I can uh, kind of guess who this is, too. I, think. <laughs> I, I bet you can, yeah. <laughs> and I, it just never ended. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I wrote him back a very nice letter, and I said, well, you're certainly entitled to your opinions. This is where I stand. You know my reasons for standing there, and I don't care what your wisdom teacher says because <laughs> they're a dime a dozen in ancient Egypt, you know. So, <laughs> so there we go. And you he know, never talked to me ever, ever again after oh, that. It's it's, yeah, and this is we we've talked before about the absurdity that goes on in the research community. Like, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, that's fascinating though, because, um, I remember the late Carmen Bolter, in my conversations with her. And one of the things that she put on the record was that, look, everything's changed in the last 10 years about how we can look at this. And of course she did the mm -hmm. pyramid code mm -hmm. and spent years and years since the seventies living mm -hmm. in Egypt and going back and forth. But in her, uh, studies, she was saying the ability that they have by the air now to map things underground, right? Uh, through this special process, and I'll think of the name as we go along here. Tomography. Yes. LIDAR in particular is the one she referenced. And so you can actually take that photography from the air and go beneath yes. the levels. Yes. So they know a lot more about Egypt in the last 10 years than they ever have, even with all you that. Yet they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where are we going now? Like they, uh, There's always been rumors that they were trying to while on the surface kind of pushing away this idea of Atlantis or a hall of records or an ancient mm -hmm. civilization there before a pre-dynastic uh, civilization, they are now, uh, you know, in a position probably to tap that, you know, ancient monuments that were inaccessible previously. But before it's very interesting because the Casey foundation you know, a lot of the people who were around that Giza Plateau and running it had a mm -hmm. former association with the uh, ARE. Right. So it's they know about it. 
Yes. Uh, you know, they know about the Casey theories. And uh, one of the guys I've pointed out here, he actually wrote a book called The Egyptian Heritage, Mark Lehner. Mm-hmm. And it's all, yeah. all the Casey readings dealing with the Hall of Records and the Sphinx. And he became the number one guy at the Giza Plateau. So yes. there's some kind of crisscross here where oh, they want to go after this stuff. Yeah. Well, look, look, I have no problem with the Hall of Records hypothesis being in, near, or under the Giza compound. And I'll mm-hmm. tell you why. If it's a center of ancient government... And if it is a hardened military site on top of that, as a center of government would be, and if it's a weapon, what are you going to have wherever you have a government? You're going to have archives. Hmm. You're going to have records. You know, this is what we were up to on such and such a day. You know, Toth came by for a visit, and Osiris was feeling bad, and, you know... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, on and on, you know, it, you're going to have records somewhere, an archival depository somewhere around there. If indeed this was a center of government and a center of power, mm-hmm. so it doesn't. It you know, again, I don't think people are are so used to thinking. Well, it's my hypothesis and nobody else's. Well, it could be everybody's right, or it could be everybody's wrong. You know, right. that's what a hypothesis is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh. Fascinating. Yeah, you must. I mean, you've had many years of struggling with this for sure, especially well, coming from completely different place. I, I well, it doesn't bother me that people get upset. What bothers me is is that is that they're so you know, tenacious about it (laughs) that they can't realize that, yeah, I'm speculating. And I, I always tell people this is speculation. This is off the end of the twig, wild and crazy nuts. Right. But it's a hypothesis that has been suggested, not by me. (laughs) Right. Right. So the question is, does it possibly make sense? That's all I'm trying to do. Right. Um, and if they want to believe in ancient wisdom teachers and <laughs> yeah, go for yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> not to mention, I, I'm not that invested, folks. <laughs> <laughs> not to mention the uh, implanted disinformation into the field. Well, exactly. People away. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the other thing. Um, I, I, you know, if you look at if you look at all the literature, Daniel, and I'm sure that that. You're familiar with the phenomenon. If you look at all the literature that has surrounded the Giza Plateau, particularly in the alternative community in the last 30 to 40 years, it is abundantly clear that there has been a massive effort to get people from, to keep them from looking at certain hypotheses too closely. It it, it is abundantly clear. Absolutely. And there's also... If they want to go outside the box, they're hit with the alien thing. Yes. You know, you have to go alien. Oh, they were too advanced for humanity, so it's alien. You know, <laughs> I mean, half uh, or three quarters of that approach can be solved with an ancient advanced culture. There's no yes. question about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's the other problem is is the alien thing. Well, you know, why does why does that structure have to be built by aliens? Like I say, you know, I'm a pipe organist, and I look at that structure, and it's Abund- you know, I look at that. I look at the dimensions of those things, and I'm just seeing numbers on on a stop jam. You know, yeah, right. it's it's that apparent. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it's it's not all that difficult to see these things in the structure. It's much more difficult to see them and say, "What does it mean? Are they mm-hmm. just there for an archival purpose, or are they there for a functional purpose?" Once you say function, then it, then the game becomes much more difficult because then you have to explain what. Right. And you can't explain the what, uh, the functional what, without a lot of scientific speculation. No ifs, ands, or buts. No what ifs, you, ands, or buts. What do you see when you look uh, across the entire grid of the globe? Hmm. You see pyramids as far away as China. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, in Mesoamerica and all these other places, it's a worldwide yes. structure yes. consciousness. Yes, and they're all linked up in certain ways. I think a lot about, you know, some of the old straight track type mm-hmm. work and the, mm-hmm. that ley lines. And on those ley lines, you would find these old structures um, 
And there's, there's great information about that. But why a worldwide pyramid building culture, Joseph? I, I tried to answer that in my book, Grid of the Gods, which is the subtitle of that is The Physics of the Pyramid Peoples. Mm. Um, I, I think that there was a global megalithic building project that took place shortly after the end of the cosmic war. And the reason that it took place was number one, they were trying to memorialize as quickly as they could and as permanently as they could. After all, you've just blown your infrastructure you know, to kingdom come <laughs> uh, as we're about ready to do now. Yeah, right. <laughs> I hate to add or gear. Uh, yeah. So the first thing you got to do is if you want to jumpstart civilization again, what do you have to have? Well, number one, you have to have commerce. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to jumpstart a, a global civilization again, that commerce has to be global. So are you going to be able to conduct global commerce with the old academic saw, which is a bunch of taurum excretum, to use the Latin? <laughs> Are you going to be able to reconstruct a global commerce using body parts for systems of measure? Mm -hmm. Answer, no. <laughs> right. So you need systems of measure that are going to be permanent and everywhere the same. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to be astronomical and or geodetically based. Fascinating. And that's what you see, in my opinion, with these megalithic structures, including the pyramids. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think you have with the pyramids, um, particularly in India and in Mesoamerica, they're oddly enough, they're the same kind of pyramid in mm -hmm. that they're, they're stepped pyramids. They're heavily ornated. In other words, they've got lots of crenellations and little embellishments and so on. But the end result is that it takes the smooth sided pyramids that you see in Egypt and multiplies the surfaces. It's almost as if you have a deliberate attempt to embody in those three dimensional structures, a hyper dimensional structure, which in a three dimensional structure is going to look like those edges are kind of, fuzzy moving back and forth mm -hmm. uh think of that movie uh with matt mcconaughey where he travels in time and sees all of these structures with so many edges that are really an attempt to to portray in three dimensions what a hyperdimensional object looks like so i think these these pyramids that you see in india and mesoamerica particularly are an attempt to embody this kind of hyperdimensional way of looking at pyramids themselves. So again, yeah, you're you're dealing with a fairly sophisticated physics. Add That's to amazing. that, yeah, add to that the the possibility that some of the the internal structures at the top of these things, or even the Roman Pantheon in Rome to give you another structure with some very weird properties. I think you're looking at the possibility that you have acoustic, or pardon me, that you have radio cavities in these big chambers. Fascinating. Yeah. They're using these things for, for communication. That really, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. So the you advanced know. communications that we have are rediscovery. Or, yeah, well, I talked about this in Babylon's Banksters. There are there are classical texts, you know, Juvenal or or Cicero or Virgil, you know, people like this that are writing, you know, about what's going on in the Roman Empire, and they'll say uh, very odd things. Well, General So and So sent to the emperor uh, for instruction, and the emperor responded the next day with do such and such. Well, General So-and-so happens to be leading a legion or cohort of troops over on the Black Sea, and the emperor is in Rome. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. So how does the general manage to send to the emperor mm. and get a response the next day? 
that's the echo of the advanced yeah. communications years ding, later. Ding, ding. They yeah, still ding. have it. Yeah, they have something going on. You know, all of this business about soothsaying and animal membranes. I think I think Dr. Constantine Mile, as I put in Babylon's Banksters, isn't and it's his idea, is entirely correct. These temples, if you look carefully at them, are very simple radio cavity resonators. Mm, wow. And yeah. what do you need to pick up a very faint radio signal? Well, you need a very sensitive membrane. Mm. And how would you do it? Well, Morse code. You do it with simple you do it with simple telegraphy and pulses. Nothing new, folks. <laughs> worldwide communications. A then. worldwide grid. Yeah, sure. Um <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna move directly from that into Ezekiel. Because okay, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the question, and you know, you've brought in Ezekiel a number of times, and you know, the typical thing about Ezekiel, which is out there, is totally wrong. But this, oh, this peasant who just kind of stumbles in and sees all this stuff. <laughs> this is a learned man, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have the actual quotation from the Bible. Okay about Ezekiel, and I won't read the whole thing. I'm just going to zero in on the section about what he saw, and okay. I want your description of it. I hope this um, is King James. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is. It's Ezekiel 1-48. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he talks about his, his age, too, saying yeah. that he's 30 years at the time. But anyway, he sees an immense dust storm come over the earth, Mm -hmm. uh, an immense cloud with lightning flashing from it, a huge ball of fire glowing like bronze. Yes. Within the fire were what looked like four creatures, vibrant with life. Each had a form of a human being, but each had four faces and four wings. Their legs were as sturdy, as straight as columns, but their feet were hoofed like those of a calf and sparkled with fire like burnished bronze. On all four sides, under the wings, they had human hands. Uh -huh. All all four had both faces and wings, and the wings touching one another, they turned neither one way nor the other. They went straight forward. Uh -huh. Their faces looked like this. In front, a human face. On the right side, the face of a lion. On the left, the face of an ox. And in the back, the face of an eagle. For the faces, the wings were spread out with the tips of one pair touching the creature on either side. The four creatures looked like a blazing fire, or like fiery torches, tongues of fire shot back and forth between the creatures, bolts of lightning, the creatures flash back and forth like strikes of lightning. And he goes on to describe these wheels within a wheel. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very interesting Casey reading about Ezekiel mm -hmm. when they're asking him to describe the Atlantean advanced craft. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, actually, there's a description in the Bible of what they were like. It's Ezekiel. He was seeing one of these craft, but that was a much later date. Mm -hmm. So um, this idea that you're talking about with them preserving this worldwide communications, what about the technology, the kind of what we hear about almost interstellar Atlanteans? How does that technology get preserved? Well, who, who, who ends up having it? <laughs> well, the first thing that I have, I've always thought every time I hear that, that, uh, segment of Ezekiel uh, or paraphrases of it or whatever is, you know, whatever he's smoking, I want some. <laughs> 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 I mean, that... What that, a description, yeah. <laughs> well, it's straight out of an LSD trip, you know, to be quite frank with you. <laughs> he's in but an altered state. For sure. He's in something. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, uh, accepting the piety thing that, you know, he's seeing probably something that he himself is not too comfortable seeing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, yeah, he's, you know, the, the, the old saw is that he's, he's seeing some sort of technology. But by the same token, he could equally be seeing a plasma. Mm -hmm. And there are there are clues in that passage that that may be exactly what he's trying to describe. He's, he's seeing something in a dust storm. Well, plasmas can be dust. Mm. 
And then he's attempting in, in the language that the way I listen to him, yeah, he's trying to describe this, you know, and this is something else that he, he describes elsewhere in, in the book, but he's trying to describe an encounter with a being, a living being. And the being makes no sense from any normal standpoint of biological life. You know, he's, he's describing something intensely chimerical. Eagles, lions, man, you know, what's that? And their heads <laughs> are, are on, if you, if you, if, yeah. well, if you, if you think of it in a certain sense, each head is on a different axis. Mm. So in other words, what he is attempting to describe is something with heads on several different axes. Mm -hmm. And once you say several different axes, what are you saying? You're saying hyperdimensional. Oh, interesting. You're saying yeah. X, Y, Z, and, you know, axis N, which is perpendicular to the other three, which are all mm -hmm. perpendicular to each other to begin with. Right. So that's hyperdimensionality, folks. He is attempting his very language, in other words, I'm telling you, his very language, because he cannot describe this mathematically. So the language, the ordinary language that he is using is exactly what you would do if you are trying to give a normal language picture of an encounter with something hyperdimensional. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what his language is describing. And therefore, if you are encountering a creature like that, a, a living entity like that, depending on how that creature is going to orient to you, you might see a different kind of face. And again, that face is going to be described in language that you know and are familiar with. It may not have been any of those four creatures. My point is that the plasma life hypothesis is an incredibly powerful hypothesis. It explains a heck of a lot of stuff. Yes, absolutely. The problem with it... <laughs> 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 gotta add this just, <laughs> just to put it on the record so that people won't pack me off to their rubber padded cell <laughs> <laughs> is the problem is of course it has yet to gain wide scientific acceptance right. it is a hypothesis and it's based, when you get right down to it, on some very peculiar things that scientists have noticed about plasmas. But the final analysis, it needs to have more going for it mm -hmm. before we can say absolutely and with certainty that all of this stuff or some of it is alive. And then, in addition to that, say that some of it may be intelligent. But when you look at the hypothesis in terms of people like Ezekiel, uh, or John of Damascus, you know. Or, oh yeah. <laughs> or you know, you like you like Rudolf Steiner, and you know you've got the Ariman thing going on in Steiner. You know, when yeah. you're looking at this hypothesis in terms of these types of people that are writing about these things, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It resolves a lot of things. That's fascinating. And uh, what's interesting to me is, and I think that biblical dating is loose anyway. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, so they... Old Testament, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole lot older. It's a whole... That's a, we, we're not going down that road here, folks. <laughs> we'll be here you all go, night. <laughs> but you go to that original Sumerian version of the Bible, it's like... Yeah, that's yeah. way... Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very, very different thing. And you know the other the other interesting thing about this is is the recensions themselves of the Old Testament, you know the the Septuagint Greek text versus the Masoretic Hebrew text. When were these dated? And the descriptions will vary. You know passages like, passages like this that you just uh, were referring to are going to vary in little tiny details. So this mm -hmm. is another thing, right? They're like um, oh, Enoch's in space. Let's just get get this book out of here. Let's right. Yeah. 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 We don't want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> What's he doing in space anyway? What's he doing up there? <laughs> yeah. 
Elijah's chariot, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we have this loose dating, and they like to date Ezekiel somewhere around 1000 BC. I think he's a lot older. Somewhere but anyway, um, the, uh, the Plato story for Atlantis and various versions from the mystery schools and Casey's mm-hmm. work and Steiner, they've got it 10,500 BC. That's right. the switch off. You know, right. Atlantis sinks. There's an egress of peoples and. You have them showing up in all these different restarting these cultures right. um, and creating these legacy cultures everywhere. But between 1000 BC, when Ezekiel is looking at this incredible thing, thing. whatever it happens to be, <laughs> whatever. It if you think about Casey saying, well, that's, that's an Atlantean craft there. He's describing it. Yeah. That's what they look like, but it's a much later date. Right. How do you account? You were just talking about this network of megalithic stones across mm-hmm. the world as a kind of a astronomical, um, you know, pinpoint for all these different types of communications. Mm-hmm. How does a group keep the kind of advanced technology the Atlanteans had from 10,500 BC to say a thousand BC? And do they, you know, show up maybe as some of those early things that people are attributing to ancient aliens and so forth? Well, I, I think the answer to the question is answered by the structures themselves. In other words, if you're going, you know, we're dealing with uh, a phenomenon, in my opinion, that is intentionally designed to do two things. Number one, preserve a system of weights and measures that are geodetically based and therefore universal across the globe that will allow you to jumpstart commerce. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in other words, if you look at the Sumerian system of weights and measures and compare it to the British imperial system, you're going to discover some astonishing correlations. That's a very, very old system of weights and measures. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing these structures do. The second thing that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to make sure that the knowledge that they preserve is permanent over time and not easily lost. So that's why you build it out of stone. You Mm -hmm. could have written it all down on paper, but you know, chances are that's not going to be around in a couple thousand years and we might not be either. So, Mm -hmm. so, you know, whoever (laughs) comes along, we want to make sure that, you know, they know that somebody was here. So that's the other thing. So I think, I think you're, you're looking at, a system of communication, you're looking at quite literally, you're looking at halls of record in stone because their dimensional measures are telling you certain things about their systems of measure. And finally, you're looking at the possibility of very simple uh, radio resonant cavities that might have been a part of some sort of communication network to the people that knew. Call them priests. Ah. Ah. (laughs) Yes. We know how to read the sign in the entrails. You don't. (laughs) Right. And all they're doing is decoding Morse code. (laughs) Right, yeah. (laughs) Worship us. Worship Um, us, yes. (laughs) That's a really great point. Keep this enterprise going. (laughs) It's interesting because, of course, the populations themselves in a great catastrophe mm-hmm. uh, with the kind of rebuilding that we hear about from the lost culture, mm-hmm. they turn completely primitive yes. in a number of ways. So yeah. a small group yes. starts to control what was left of the technology, what was left of the power stations, what was left of the knowledge base. Yes, I think you have to. In other words, if if you look at that scenario, Daniel, at the end of a, of a cataclysm, a major infrastructure planet busting war Mm -hmm. if if you are faced with that what's the other thing you have to have you have to have continuity of government Mm -hmm. you know you've talked about this over and over and it would be no different in ancient times there has to be a continuity of government there have to be people in other words with the expertise Mm -hmm. to continue the the necessary sciences and arts for administration it's that simple 
So in other words, I've always viewed, you know, the ancient secret societies or mystery schools or whatever you want to call them as being in effect, this kind of ancient continuity, Atlantean continuity of government operation. That's exactly what it is. Wow. And yeah. you're going to have, you know, if you've just fought a war and blown up somebody else's planet and maybe fought, you know, fought the same people here on the surface of this planet, then you're going to have several continuities of government in operation. Right. So they're going to, as necessary, make common cause with each other. And at, at times they're going to be fighting each other. And this, again, is what I think the record on this planet bears out, is that you do have that kind of um, factional fighting going on. But at the same time, you've got a lot of, you know, common outlook, common ways of thinking, mm -hmm. measuring. Um, I think I think the scenario makes eminent sense. You know, virtually, virtually every tradition that we can think of here on Earth, Daniel, has some version of this cosmic war of the gods, virtually every single one. Right. There's an so, echo, the Tower of Babel, which you can Tower of Babel, about. you know, yeah. the Greek Gigantomachy, St. Michael and Lucifer, Iblis and, and uh, Gabriel and Islam. You know, it goes on and on. Everybody's got some version of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, I think it makes eminent sense when you compare it exactly to what's going on today. You know, we've been here before. Fascinating. And we, um, this gets right to the heart of the mystery about it because so much of it is hidden and we're mm -hmm. given it in this fragmented form. When they communicate with each other, mm -hmm. let's say these groups that preserve the information, they might communicate through things like geometry or right. mathematics. Right. So that's a whole steganography that an yes. average person is not going to be able to see. Well, let's go further. If if you if you are dealing with intelligent life in plasmas, mm -hmm. how do they communicate? Right. Well, by the nature of the case, I think you're dealing with something electromagnetic in by dint of the kind of life form that it would be. Mm -hmm. And therefore, its communication is going to be in those terms. And therefore, because of that, in turn, it's likely to be highly symbolic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be it's going to be ideogrammatic in nature. Rather, you know, to draw an analogy to human to human languages, it's going to be it's going to be more like an ideogrammatical language like Chinese or Sumerian or Egyptian rather than than uh, phonetical and alphabetic in nature, like Hebrew or English or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think that's the kind of communication system that, that they would use. And they're not going to necessarily have, you know, mouths and vocal cords and ears as the way that they do it. They're going to be sending electrical, acoustical signals to each other. Mm -hmm. And it will be, again, Pulses. It will be literally uh, the music of the spheres. They'll be they'll be talking harmonically. They'll be quote unquote singing. So it'll be a very different kind of language. But that's what you see again. You know this. This is why I'm, you know, I'm fascinated with the plasma life hypothesis because its explanatory power is absolutely off the charts. Right. When you yes. look at all this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, charts. It's fascinating, too, the way that you present it, because what I'm thinking when I think about these advanced groups and they're keeping the technology over time, they have to kind of reason to themselves, well, the last time we all got together on this, there was a big <laughs> war. And uh, so let's do it. Let's keep it away from everyone else. And we're right. going to network it in our own way. But you end up having very uh, kind of unique groups with the secrecy to a point yep. where you might have a secret society that's trying to move the culture forward from afar and yep. inserting things into that culture to get people, yep. you know, or, or kind of raise their wisdom level. And then yep. there's another group that's using it to subvert and enslave yep. the population on the surface. So those groups are fighting in the background and neither one yep. can come out and say, hi, you know, exactly. <laughs> I'm the evil guy. Hi, I'm the good guy. 
Yeah, you're going to have the same debates, just exactly as you've outlined. Uh, you're going to have groups that want to disclose everything, the people's right to know, and all of that. And by doing so, we'll raise everybody to you know raise their standard of you know. And you're going to have the secrecy people. No, we can't. We can't turn all of this stuff over to those monkeys. They'll blow us all up again. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. All of those debates are going to be are going to be there at the outset. And, and they've always been there. So yeah, do we find do we find both strains of thought throughout history? Absolutely, we're going through it now. Yeah, you know, yeah, we're right in the heart of it we're now. We're right in the heart of it now. It's just, you know, it's at the end new. of this. Um, I'm sorry, finish that last. No, I, I was just said it's nothing new. It is exactly right. It's like a repeat of a cycle, and again, yep. you have us coming around, hitting this point. And we're sort of facing off into this yep. Atlantean timeline in a way. Yep, absolutely. Um, in uh, this book, well, this book is incredible uh, as well. It's it's a fairly quick read, interestingly enough, too, uh -huh. because it is. Um, you it's it's basically kind of the ultimate overview of the other books, or it brings all yes. the Death Star books. Um, at the very end of the book, you bring up the Two Eye Stone and the Casey uh -huh. work around mm -hmm. atlantis there's mm -hmm. there's a description there of the terrible mighty crystal in the right. casey work which is actually a line that features in the bible a couple of times yes um, right. in uh the hall of records idea inside of the hall of records according to casey is the construction of the two eye stone right does that factor into any of this because well, sure here you know this is what's hidden yes the hall of records will contain a history yes it'll have all this you know kind of tablets for things but actually in there is also the construction of the two eye stone right that's kind of a problem <laughs> for a culture like ours to open up and the groups that are in charge now they run around after this hall of records they open up and they get access to the two eye stone this gets the archaeological wars oh yeah which is also a major theme in your work Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've been, I've been convinced and, and, you know, I wrote, I wrote all this in, in the cosmic war. Um, and I've hinted at it in, in other books since then, I've been convinced that the war in Iraq, when, when we went in under Bush, the stupid looking for weapons of mass destruction, that they were telling us a partial truth they really were looking for ma weapons of mass destruction. They just weren't looking for modern ones. Oh, right. I think they were quite literally and very possibly looking for the so-called tablets of destinies or two eye stone, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, because I do think the tablets of destinies, when you read about them carefully and particularly what Sitchin says about them in his books, uh, and when when you compare what he says about them with other academic translations of the same texts, it's clear that you're dealing with physical objects of some sort, and it is also clear that you're dealing very possibly with crystals of some sort. <laughs> you know, that's the problem <laughs> here. And so in in the in the cosmic war, I pointed out that some of these tablets of destinies were of such a nature they could not be destroyed. Wow. So they were hidden. And when you're thinking of a substance like that, you're thinking, okay, it's a substance that is probably extraordinarily hard, you know, way beyond diamond. And you're thinking also of a substance that's crystalline in nature. And then there are other little hints that Sitchin drops, like the business about being pulled, the certain gods being pulled when they're over the Great Pyramid. So in the original Giza Death Star, I, I hypothesized that you had a kind of crystal inside the structure that had an index of refraction such that light would get trapped inside the crystal and simply spin around like a superconductor. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was not 
electricity, it was light doing this. And that as a result of that, it creates a pseudo-gravitational effect. In other words, the crystal begins sort of to function like a miniature black hole. Now, that is as wacky. I, I, I thought, okay, if you're going to do that, this is what it has to be. But it was so highly speculative at the time, Daniel, I literally sweat bullets on whether or not to include that idea in the original version of the book that was put out. Okay? Yes. It was so off the wall. You were out pitching I, I, I Oh, yeah. You know, fit this guy for a rubber room. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's that kind of material. And I finally decided, okay, yeah, I'm, I've already gone way off the deep end otherwise, so I might as well include this. Lo and behold, now, now, in the last two to three years, and I even include some of these papers in the Giza Death Star Revisited, scientists have basically proposed and created out of metamaterials a kind of acoustic crystal that does exactly what I was talking about, trapping light inside of a crystal, and they're even calling it pseudo-gravity. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, it's just, you know, you can't make this stuff up, folks. <laughs> right. <laughs> And you wouldn't want to, you know, otherwise, otherwise you're going to be like me. Join me in the rubber room. You know? <laughs> they just let that story out this year. Isn't that Yeah, true? they did. That's right. Amazing. Yeah, they did. I, yeah. So, you I know, mean, that I, really crisscrosses directly with your ancient research. Absolutely. It does. Absolutely. It does. So, you know, I'm thinking, okay, they go into Iraq and, and they, they're looking for these dang things. You know, we're at the beginning of it with these metamaterial crystals. Imagine a civilization that has that kind of material science that it has been developing for, oh, a century or two. Mm -hmm. You know? So, yeah, I think, I think there's an archaeology war that they're looking for this stuff big time. Big time. Absolutely. Wow. It explains a lot. Uh, it really does. And it explains... The kind of infiltration of the places like the Casey Foundation, right. for example. Would would they want as much information as they could find about this stuff, either from a Casey reading, and would they want the so to speak the Hall of Records blueprint version? How do we how do we make this stuff? <laughs> you know, <You're> right. <laughs> you know, what's what's the recipe? Yeah, you bet they would. Oh yeah, you bet. Yeah, recipe. That is it. Yeah, really. that's it. Yeah. Uh, how do you construct this? After all, bingo. Um, and it's interesting too if we think about the underwater area fifty one, Autech being right where again they're supposed to be the other version of the Hall of Records off right. Bimini, right. you know, and there they are at Andros Island with Autech, you know. <laughs> My that's My suspicion to is they have to they have to they're gonna find out that they have to grow these crystals in as much of a gravity neutral environment as they can. Interesting. Why is that? It's a complicated answer, but basically a crystal's lattice defects as a crystal grows. The lattice defects in a crystal are signatures of the gravitational space-time lattice in which the crystal is grown. Follow me? Mm. So that if you had a sufficiently advanced science of crystallography, you would be able to look, in my opinion, at the lattice defects of a crystal like quartz or diamond or ruby or whatever, you would be able to look at the imperfections in that crystal and be able to deduce from them the environment, the gravitational environment in which the crystal grew. Follow? Yeah. So if that's the case, if you want to make a particular crystal as efficient a resonator or oscillator of all or as many possible gravitational signatures as possible, mm -hmm. 
you would have to grow that crystal in as gravity neutral a place as possible. This is why crystals grown in space in zero gravity have much fewer lattice defects than the very same substance grown as a crystal on the surface of this planet. Fascinating. So I would bet mm. you dollars to donuts yeah. that Mr. Casey's 2A stone blueprints in the Hall of Records are going to tell you, grow the stuff as far away from gravity, you know, grow it in the Kuiper belt on the edge of the solar system. Wow. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> that, that sort of thing. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is very, very interesting because when you get into, I mean, just for a non-scientific person at all, mm-hmm. how much do crystals control our day-to-day life as it is? <laughs> yeah. You and I are looking at each other on a liquid crystal screen. <laughs> You know? <laughs> we're in the crystal already. Yeah, we're in it already. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And if you, you know, if you get right down to it, what are we? DNA is what? It's an aperiodic crystal. Oh, fascinating. Wow. You know, so we, you know, we're crystalline creatures. Every every living thing that you can think of mm-hmm. is is a little crystal. It's a living crystal. You made now, a point about the Great Pyramid that granite is a is a kind of crystal granite is a kind of crystal because it has lots of little shards of quartz it's quartz bearing so the grape and so is limestone for that matter right right so So, the great casing that they took off to build cairo well that's crystal the great pyramid is a big crystal Mm -hmm. because why well it for one thing the the angles on the faces are inclined at exactly the same inclination as a quartz crystal oh Oh, wow. Oh, Unbelievable. Oh. Yeah, you know, there this is one of those little dimensional things. Mm-hmm. And that's just one out of thousands. Incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. That's just really we I mean, when you speak about crystals like this, you know, I don't think people get it when they talk about, you know, casing crystals, they think, well, it's like a Sedona crystal, you know, holding on no. a power crystal. <laughs> this is very different stuff. It's, yeah, K- there's a good reason Casey had all these visions of the thing, folks, <laughs> <Right. laughs> and associated it with Giza. <laughs> could could the could the ether be trying to tell us something here? Maybe <laughs> he's talking about you know oh there are lapis mines that the Atlanteans yeah. used in Arizona. Well, lapis is all through the Egyptian culture. Oh, absolutely, we know. Um, absolutely. absolutely, so very powerful properties there. The last thing in this section, Joseph, this mm-hmm. is absolutely fascinating. We did an episode recently on the Akashic Record. Yes. And um, one of the things I mentioned in there is that Steiner mentions what the qualities of the Akashic Record are. And he said they're written in the etheric. Yes. And then he goes on uh, to describe this. And then later, there are people who are interested in reading the Akashic Record using etheric devices. Mm-hmm. And this comes up in the Casey information and other places. What do you think of this concept, one, of the Akashic Record, and two, the idea that it's in the ether and therefore can be read? Oh, I, 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 huh. I, I absolutely subscribe to the idea yeah. because for, the, for a very simple f- reason, and that is information cannot be destroyed. Right. If you stop and really wrap your mind around what is information, it cannot be destroyed. Once a specific piece of information arises, that information is always there. It's eternally true. Once it arises, it's eternally true. Now, there may be a point at which it arises before which it does not exist. That's also true. But once it arises, you can't get rid of it. Right. That's in other words, it's like it's like taking this piece of paper here. Okay, that's that's your nothing. And then you crumple it up. You've added information to it. And now you unfold it and try and smooth it back out to nothing. But you still got all the wrinkles that were impressed right. on it. All it's in a third state. 
it's, yes. So if if you're if you're connecting all of this with plasma life hypothesis, well, what is plasma in many cases? Well, we know that plasmas have interior regions and boundaries and membranes, you know, just like life does. Um, that they're not homogeneous structures. And as such, they are also aperiodic. Here we go again, you know. So once you've said that, could they also be information storage structure? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because what are plasmas made out of? Well, protons, neutrons, electrons, in other words. <laughs> right. They're, they're made out of the very same thing that comprise us. What do we do? We store information. So could could all of this information actually be stored in a kind of plasma cloud, coining the pun in as many ways as possible? Yeah, exactly. Wow, well, yeah. You know, when I say this is an extremely powerful explanatory hypothesis, I mean it. So, yeah, you're storing all this information in the cloud, up there, out there, in the ether, whatever. And we know what ether is in physics. It's a compressible medium. <laughs> okay. Right. It's, yes. it's, it's, it's the medium on which waves can wave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so could you read that information? Well, what would that information consist of? It would be a wave of what? Compression, rarefaction. It's a pulse. Worldwide so, communication. Yeah. Could you yeah. could you read it? Yeah, sure, of course you could. If you if you had a technology to create those kinds of waves and then to detect them, obviously you could. And what's the best kind of wave detector for those kinds of waves? Thomas Townsend Brown. Oh right. Stone. Yes. Crystal, diamond, granite, quartz, ruby. Sapphires. Sapphires, you know, have been known for a long time to be the gr best gravity wave detectors. Sapphire, think about that. Gravity. Fascinating. Solomon's foundation stone of the universe is a sechthia, the Hebrew word for sapphire. You know, there's there's something going on in all this lore, folks. <laughs> right. Well, that I don't think takes it's me to the Urim and Thummim. That's the uh, Urim and the Thummim. Yeah, bingo, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I um, you know, I spent some time reading some letters between Blavatsky and her sister. Oh wow! I didn't even know she had a sister. Yeah, and her wow. sister is like a celebrated writer in Russia. I didn't so, know that. Very interesting. I'll actually send you. Um, okay. Her book. But um, it's very interesting, her interrelation with Blavatsky as well. Um, but one of the things that comes up in the letters is uh -huh. that um, this thing about fairy gold. And um, this is interesting. Blavatsky refers to fairy gold. But at a certain point in these letters, the um, the sister asks, well, you know, where is this coming from if you're dealing with these masters? Like, where are they getting? Are they manifesting this gold? What is this? And she said, well, it's a very interesting thing to note that the schools of the mystery run a number of mines across oh, wow. the planet. And that uh, they have a hard time, basically, because when people discover the mines, they get into all these different things like, you know, hostile battles. The people mm -hmm. are trying to control one diamond mind or whatever. But this association of the mystery groups with the minds had a crisscross for me with your Babylon Bankster theme. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I can see that. Um, in fact, there are in, <laughs> in the lore of gems, you know, I, I was a boy when we went to Washington, D.C., and I stood on the other side of a glass pane at, at the Smithsonian Institution and looked at the Hope Diamond. You know, this, this <laughs> oh, mass, yeah. massive blue diamond. Uh, and I've, I've been fascinated by gemstones ever since. 
Well, in the lore, you know, it's like my artillery fetish, folks. I have, you know, I have all these weird hobbies, but <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right. um, in in the lore of gems, it's amazing to me how many famous gemstones, usually diamonds, but sometimes sapphires and rubies. It's amazing to me how many of these big ones have some sort of story, weird, weird stories associated with them. So I'm not at all surprised that maybe there are whole um, hidden tales of what mine to go to to get a particular type of stone. Mm-hmm. Um, that again, and and I'm not I'm I'm stressing that idea because it would follow from the idea that a crystal is grown in a particular gravitational spatial environment. Mm -hmm. So if you want a particular thing, the lore is telling you that this is what is creating this particular type of crystal. And it's that environment that enables this crystal to do this particular thing Mm -hmm. or to be resonant with that particular configuration of space time. Okay. Um, It would not surprise me at all. Therefore that there's something like this operating with minds. Interesting. Not at all. And and the more the more they know about this lore, and the more their science develops of how to read the lattice structure of a crystal, and interpret from that lattice structure the environment, the more sophisticated that science becomes. Then the more they're going to look for particular places for particular crystals. Um, it, it seems to me it follows. Uh, now. To your average scientist or chemist or materials engineer, what I've just told you is nuts. We don't have anywhere close to that kind of science. Right. My point is maybe they better start looking at some of this lore a little more carefully and closely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We know certain, uh, you know, from whether it's the Nazis or other groups, they've they looked into it deeply. Oh yeah. So uh, for the scientific community to ignore it on a public level is absurd. There is there is in crystal lore in in gemology lore, and I don't even I'm not going to even say what it is because I'm I'm writing what I hope will be a fun little book about it in addition to the book that I told you about (laughs) earlier. But in in the lore of gemology, there is a missing gemstone that has been missing for about 250 years. Huh. It was about 757 carats. Wow. In other words, it was about as big as a cantaloupe. The lore has it that several other famous gems, much smaller, but still, you know, substantial in size. Not something you'd wear on a ring. (laughs) (laughs) But that several other smaller stones were cut from it. Hmm. Um, I'm not convinced of that. Interesting. And because of that, I think you might be looking at the possibility that this missing massive gemstone might be, might be one of those ancient tablets of destinies might be fascinating, particularly given where it was originally discovered, but I'm not going to talk about that. (laughs) (laughs) For It's making me think of the crystal skull, the way you're describing it. It, Well, it would have been about that big. Okay. It would have been about that big. Uh, the crystal skull, the Mitchell Hedges skull is yay big. About It probably would be about 750 carats. I don't know exactly what it would weigh in terms of kilograms or pounds or carats, but uh, it is a highly polished quartz crystal mm-hmm. with some unusual internal lattice work. Oh, um, yeah. It has that, yeah, it has that bending of of light that occurs when a light source is put beneath it 
Um, oh, it's the incredible. A, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. the testing that thing has been through, it's fascinating too, because when people are in the same room with the skull, their own kind of consciousness gets lifted up in a way that they seem able to access information. Right. It, it leads me to believe that's what it was for in the first place. It could very well be. You know, uh, again, crystals, you know, quartz crystals in particular, he, he, uh, the whole development of radio, you know, where would we be without quartz crystals and, and radio? You know, little those little crystal sets you used to be able to buy when we were kids, you know, and make your own little radio crystal set. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, there's something about crystals that allow you to tune in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. We're right back to square one again. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you focus hard and heavy on crystals in this book, especially oh, yeah. in that closing chapter. And it brings, I think, the whole thing about the series of books together. And it's an unusual uh, and, uh, you know, the course of those books over time has really opened up. And um, so they're extraordinary on that level, which is if you take them over the course of 20 years of you interpreting the data, this book seems to be kind of like, well, here's that little thing that I left out. <laughs> the little thing, the little thing that all of you sensed was missing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, it's like I say, Daniel, it's not necessary to the weapon hypothesis, but once you, once you factor it in, uh, the explanatory power of, of the plasma life hypothesis is absolutely enormous. Incredible. Wow. I mean, I, you know, every day I'm thinking of something else that, that it makes sense of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, the other day I was thinking about Ash Wednesday, you know. Oh, yeah. Dust, dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Mm. Well, there is a plasma for you. Right. Plasmas, yes. plasmas are dust. You know, so <laughs> you're a plasma. That's where you're going to go, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely okay. fascinating. Joseph, just amazing information. Stay right there and we'll do part two for Dark Journalist subscribers. Going even deeper on Plasma Life. UFOs, and Atlantis. You can become a subscriber now by visiting darkjournalist.com. Of course, Joseph's new book is available at gizadestar.com, published by Adventures Unlimited Press. Please join us on Friday, November 17th at 8 p.m. Eastern for a very special presentation and documentary. JFK 60, Blue Enigma, The UFO Files, Secret Space Program, and The Assassination. Some startling new information that points directly to aerospace. You don't want to miss it. Thank you for joining us tonight, and I'll see you soon.